Welcome to the Motoring Podcast, your weekly discussion of motoring news. This is episode 537 on Tuesday, the 8th of August, 2023. Hello, I'm Alan. Hello, I'm Andrew. And as everyone still seems to be on holiday in the news, we'll be discussing how a driver is at fault for an autonomous car crash. In new new car news, we'll look at two cars that will delight the anti-SUV brigade. And in points of interest, we find a new reason to look at Google Street View. But first, we do have follow-up. And I will start... <sighs> right, this one won't take long. The ULEZ now had... Well, it always had a scrappage scheme for the ULEZ expansion. But to be entitled to get the £2,000, there was an incredible amount of hoops and uh, fences to be jumped and criteria to be met. Uh, Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London, has said that that has now been removed and anyone in London can uh, get access to the scrappage scheme. This has upset, though, you will be surprised to hear over the latest culture wars that is <laughs> ultra low emission zones. This has upset the Kent County Council because they feel that their residents who travel into London will be unfairly hit by this because. Uh, it is only for residents of London that the ULEZ hmm. scrappage scheme is uh, enabled. They've gone to the point, this is Kent, Surrey and Essex, so I'm, I'm guessing which party leads these county councils. They have gone to the point that they will ban ULEZ signage on their land, which seems incredibly petty, even for Britain. It is, isn't it? They're also pointing out, by the way, that the withdrawal of the day travel card on public transport. Yes, that is a fair point. Also just makes it worse. At the same time as introducing this, as well as it's not just that, it's also the withdrawal of the day travel card. But yes, saying we're not going to put up the signage here is is quite spectacularly petty. I'd be interested to know, because as we made clear last week, um, the Mayor of London had to expand the ULES zone or area mm. in order to get the extra emergency funding off the government, the Conservative government. It'd be interesting to know whether that day card is also part of that. That day travel card is part of yes, that in so order much, for them um, to generate, you know, a, a more sub a sustainable income. Mm -hmm. One thing I will say is the, the article that we've linked in the show notes is from the BBC, uh, and it does talk about scrappage schemes. But then anytime you look, it's for replacing non-compliant cars. It never actually says what is going to happen to, to the cars. So if you are a proper grown-up journalist then that might be one worth investigating. Does it actually require scrappage or is it just to help you replace an existing vehicle? So you could go trade a car in and then that dealer group can then sell that car wherever it is more appropriate mm. in the country, uh, which, to be honest, sounds the most likely. Yeah. Another point to the what you could get the money for, I did see ages ago, and I don't know, I, I haven't had a chance to check whether it's still part of it, but cargo bikes mm. were going to, so if you were getting rid of your vehicle, your car or van, and you chose to get a cargo bike instead, you would get money to help to purchase that. Cargo bikes are almost as expensive as cars, well, yeah. if not more so. Yeah. Crazy money. Crazy money. Anyway. Lots of noise being made over this, lots of mutterings and grumblings, uh, not a lot of very, very clear information, I, I don't think. Mm. Yeah, there we go. It's a thing. That's the end of the facts. We move on. Yes. Kite. Sorry. Second piece of follow-up this week is Uber. We haven't talked about Uber for ages and ages, and for a long time we were talking every week about the uh, Uber Volvo XC90, which had the Volvo crash protection stuff all turned off. Uh, and Uber Technologies, is that the right name? I think so. It was a self-driving car, and there was a, a, a lady at the wheel um, who was meant to be monitoring it perhaps more closely than, than she was uh, when it hit a pedestrian who was walking their bicycle across the street mm. in Tempe. Yep. And this has gone on. This is, what, five years? Five yes, years. five years since the accident happened. Yeah. Uh, and eventually it all got to a courtroom uh, last week where Rafaela Vasquez, who was the person in charge of the car, she pleaded guilty to one count of endangerment and was sentenced to three years of supervised probation with no time in prison. Worth mentioning that Uber, 
Nothing. Zip. Zero. Zip. Absolutely nothing against for Uber. There's a, quite a lot. There's some, a couple of really good articles on this. There's one from Wired. Uh, there's another one from Fred of the Shoe. Ed Niedermeyer as well, looking at those, particularly from the who should really have been responsible. Yes, because there's, there's some bits to this. That oh, there's many layers to this. There was a, very quickly, the, the police put out a picture that seemed to indicate that the lady was watching the voice on her phone. Mm-hmm. Uber did have a phone policy where you weren't allowed to use your own phone mm-hmm. for watching anything whilst you were a safety driver. They, they at least had that. They had very little else, but they did have that. But she uh, stands by the fact that she wasn't watching. She was only listening, which was allowed. She was actually looking at her work phone, mm. checking the Slack messages, which is what she has been instructed to do by Uber to keep up to date with what is going on. Mm-hmm. Yes, she admits that she wasn't paying attention to the road because she was looking at a work-mandated message system that put the requirement on her to look check those whilst, the, whilst in the car moving. Also, the Uber technologies didn't detect mm-hmm. the person until very late. And then when they did detect the person, they didn't activate the brakes. Yet, as yeah. you just said, Uber have, have not been held responsible in any shape or form except for giving the family a lot of money yes. to not take it to court. Yes. She's done this plea bargain, basically, because she was so scared of going to prison. Mm-hmm particularly being a a transgender lady and the problems she's had in the past Mm -hmm. when it comes to that sort of thing. The moral crumple zone is the phrase that is used that somebody coined in an article that's linked to in Ed's very good piece that you do need to read. Yeah, And and it just backs up what we've been saying now for some time about how car companies are abstaining their responsibility Mm -hmm. when they know their systems are set up for us humans to fail at. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's new news now, and it's the start of the month, Alan. Yes, it is the start of the month, and that obviously means that it is the UK's new car registration figures, uh, this time obviously for July 2023. Overall, the market is up 28.3% in July. That makes non-stop growth of some form or other so far this year, which is a wonderful headline. However, it is still significantly down on uh, pre-COVID type numbers really to get back to the 143,921 vehicles registered in July, you'd be having to go back to 2012. Yay, it's up, but also it's it's a decade since it's been, other than the last couple of years, it's a decade since it's been at this point. Yeah, let's not delude ourselves. Let's be positive, but not delude ourselves. As ever, uh, battery uh, electric vehicles uh, taking significant share uh, of the market these days with 16%. Diesel's very low percentage, especially if, if it's non-hybrid of any form, and petrol cars taking taking 40% of the market for non-hybrid petrol cars. Mm-hmm. We'd have just an usual breakdown of numbers, hence my slight hesitation as I go through them and couching my words very, very carefully. Yes, shame on Tristan for not providing that free service for us all to take <laughs> yes. advantage of. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Quite. <laughs> Quite. But you, interestingly, you mentioned the, the um, battery electric vehicles year to date. There's still only 16.1%. That's, that's brilliant compared to mm. previous years, but it's still nowhere near next year's requirement. No, it's not. Just to remind everyone, next year, unless there is a huge jump in percentages for the rest of this year and that stays static, car companies are going to throttle what you are able to buy. Absolutely. Just to point out that this surge uh, means that there is a new EV being registered every 60 seconds. However, it's expected but by the end of the year, it'll be one every 50 seconds. You see somebody sitting there with a stopwatch. Right, you'll go. I think so, yeah. You go. go. How long does it take to actually register, though, the whole process before you press the send button? (laughs) Don't even go there. Yeah, so which point is registered? One other thing that they've introduced before we get to the top 10 is that there's a new thing on here, which is plug-in registrations per new standard charger installed, and it's broken down by quarter right at the minute. Uh, SMMT are pointing out that the charger rollout is progressing and is accelerating because, of course, the 
fewer new registrations per standard charger installed means that there is a better coverage of charging network. So it is down. Uh, they've been they've certainly been showing this for the last year. It is down to 35 vehicles per charger. Q4 of 2022, it was 62 vehicles per charger, which is higher, uh, lower. It's worse. Lower, not that it's worse. Worse is a better word, if you know what I mean. It, which is worse uh, and then it, it improving. It is pointed out, though, that, that there is no overarching strategy for this and whether or not and how quickly charges are installed and where they can be allowed to be installed and all sorts of stuff like that come from competition from local authorities going either yay or nay, depending on how they feel on a particular day, uh, as well as how easy it is to connect to the, to the grid, how quickly that's actually done, if, if it's done at the expected schedule and all sorts of fun stuff like that. There is no overarching strategy. There is just a mandate that says you've got to do this, yeah, but no actual way to enable or ease that, which, as we all know, makes for a pretty darned rubbish strategy. Yes. He says, putting his work hat on and then taking it off again. Anyway, I shall stop ranting about that and I shall tell you about the best registers. Yes. Uh, we go in at number 10 with the boring dolphin itself, the Tesla Model Y with 2,284 registrations. Slightly ahead of that, number nine, the Toyota Igo Cross. Number eight, the Audi A3. Uh, number seven, the Ford Cougar. Number six, the Vauxhall Corsa. And number five, the Hyundai Tucson. Hyundai Tucson is at 2,608 registrations. That's less than 400 uh, registrations between fifth and tenth on here. Mm. I don't know. The diversity of models these days does start to make some of these a bit redundant, really. Yeah. Vauxhall Mocha comes in after a bit of a jump. Uh, at number four and 3,002 registrations, the Qashqai 3,032, the Kia Sportage 3,060, and in at number one, uh, over 1,100 more, re- almost 1,100 more registrations, the Ford Puma at 4,124. Truly, it is the son of Fiesta. Yes. RIP. Year to date. I would tell you, but I've just closed the window in anticipation of the spreadsheet of doom. I'll run through year to date quickly then. At tenth is the Ford Fiesta, ninth is the Mocha, eighth. Well, I mean that's that's pretty good. The Fiesta's still clinging on, considering it's yeah. no longer built. Eighth is the Mini, seventh is the Duke, sixth is the Sportage, fifth is the Tucson. So the Koreans fighting each other for fifth and sixth. Fourth is the Tesla Model Y. Third is the Nissan Qashqai at 23,015. Second is the Vauxhall Corsa at 23,751. And first is the Ford Puma on 26,889. Woo! Spreadsheet of doom then. I'll start with the dooms, because there are a few actually. I'm not doing all the goods because there's too many. I shall pick and choose. So on you go, you do the glooms first then. Dooming, we have Bentley down 24%. Just to put that in context, last year they registered 121, this year 92. Yeah. So that's... I'm not sure they're quaking in their shoes about that. No, but that's quite a lot of profit, considering how bespoke they all are. That, but that's only in the UK. Yeah, yeah, If yeah, those yeah. other 30 are going somewhere, are going to the Middle East, or they're coming over here to the US, there's far more profit to be made. Yeah. Dacia's down at 54%, DS is down at 47%, Fiat is down 44%, then Genesis is down at 35%. Jaguar down 16%. Then the last one is Smart, which is down 62%. So last year, 73, this year, 28. But they're about to bring out their hash one. I was about to say the hash or number one, whatever it's called, is being as media drives today at uh, Mercedes-Benz World. Right. Okay, then cherry picking the good ones. Cherry picking the good ones because most are green uh, to an extent or other, much higher than the 15% that we normally say. Um, a bath haven't been having a great time of it recently. However, they do seem to have some vehicles for the UK market, so they're up at eight hundred and thirty-seven percent. That means seventy-five vehicles registered. Um, Audi up twenty-four. Oh, I might as well just go through this. Audi up twenty-four. Citroen up fifty-seven. But Ford up fifty-five, as we saw by those Puma numbers. Those yeah. were really good. Kia up thirty-seven percent. Lexus up one hundred and fifty. 9% because mm. um, yeah, they were pretty they were struggling with supply last year 
Maserati up 23, Mazda up 80, MG up 97%, Nissan 30, Peugeot 41. There was some good news amongst the Stellantis, unlike last month where yeah. every Stellantis brand was having a grim time of it. Mm. It is much better, uh, much better this month. Uh, Polestar up 573%, that's 1,300 vehicles registered. Porsche up 27, Renault up 30. Uh, Seat up 40, Skoda up 55. Volkswagen Group doing pretty well in the UK right at the minute. Got some supply again. It, it, well, well, I think what you're seeing from all these numbers, I know you haven't quite finished going through them all, but we're seeing how constrained car companies were on supply, just mm. as a reminder to back to those times. But also I would suggest with Mazda as well, don't forget, they stopped using the railway line all the way through Russia. Oh, yeah. But so Mazda for a long time to keep emissions down, do all sorts of good stuff. They were bringing their vehicles via the Trans Siberian Railway. Mm. All obviously, all of a sudden in March last year, they couldn't use the Trans Siberian Railway anymore. Yeah. They had to completely rejig it. And of course, it took longer to get to find the ships and it took longer to get stuff here by ship. So there's a big gap last year where Mazda, there was just nothing they could do. Yeah. There was demand. There were vehicles, but there were no way to get them from Japan to the UK and to Europe. Yeah. You're quite right. It's, there's, there's a lot of stuff behind some of these numbers. Uh, where was I? Subaru. Oh, was I? Thank you. Uh, Subaru up 32%, 99 vehicles registered. Suzuki up 62%. Uh, Tesla. <laughs> so Tesla in July 2022 registered three vehicles. In 2023, they registered 3,141. That gives a percentage change of 104,600%. Well done on the MG Award this month. Yes, that, that's a new top, I think. Vauxhall, 89%. Volkswagen, 28 Volvo, 67 Other British, 215 And other imports, 49.57. Good month. A lot of companies. Lots of, lots of positives there. Yeah. Well, I will take us now on to the news that researchers have jailbroken uh, a Tesla so that they could access the upgrade elements of the vehicle. Remember that each car is fitted with everything. <laughs> <laughs> and then you pay a subscription or you pay extra on the options list to get access to things like heated rear seats, etc. And that's non-transferable to the next owner. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yay! The car, car industry finding new ways to ensure there is a recurring income. Which I get. I do get. But uh, these uh, researchers were are from uh, Technical University of Berlin, who, and I'm, there's no way I'm trying to pronounce the actual German phrasing of that. Um, but they are going to present their research at the Black Hat Cybersecurity Conference in Las Vegas soon. It was it's an interesting one because they actually had to have physical access to the car, uh, and mm -hmm. this was a car that one of them owned, so it's okay. From that point of view, they didn't just go up to some random car in the street and do this. Well, it's okay unless, unless it's okay unless you're Tesla, who did, don't really feel that anybody owns that car. It, so we don't need to worry that somebody's hacking in via internet connection or anything like that. Mm -hmm. This is they physically needed to be able to get hold of it. And what they did is they did something called voltage glitching, where they uh, changed the amp rate uh, on a particular processor that runs the infotainment. And when they did it at the correct voltage or change of the um, changes of the voltage, this caused the uh, system to basically have a hiccup, is how it's described in the TechCrunch article that is linked in the show notes. The, the technical article is great because you've just gone into great technical detail. And all they say is uh, it's saying that Verling explained that what they did was fiddle around with the supply voltage of the AMD processor that runs the infotainment system. Yes. So it caused this hiccup, uh, and then that meant that they could get access into the the secure, well, what was thought to be the secure element that you couldn't normally access. But it, what it does highlight: don't connect the infotainment system in cars to everything, please, car companies. Please, please stop doing that. Yes, but that means you have to have more than one massive screen. <laughs> this is this is something we're going to be seeing more of. I mean, there's already you get little OBD2 units and, and and applications which can can plug in and you can activate many features which are options that mm. you would uh, that your your dealer uh, I'm thinking BMW, Audi, uh, Volkswagen, 
Mercedes. Mercedes, particularly the German companies do. Uh, you can go, you know, change, change your indicator noise and all that kind of fun stuff from that. Uh, I think that, that obviously as, as they see some of these changes as a revenue, a potential revenue source in the future, then obviously these things are going to get more locked down in future operating systems. Mm. So some of those OBD2 techniques, those simple OBD2 techniques are probably not going to work as much. And I think we're going to see much more of this happening yeah. to, you know, turn on heated seats and, and such like. Yeah, they, they said that they could access things like the driver assistance systems that uh, Tesla jumps up and down and shouts about a lot uh, and, and that sort of thing. So, it, But they didn't, they didn't access those to see whether the, they could actually enable it, but they could see mm. it on the system they were in. Requires mm. further research. But yeah, as, as you say, as car companies go more and more into this, then people are going to find different ways in which to hack into their cars or into cars to be able to get access because the car companies are fitting everything now. So mm. people go, well, I want access to everything, but I don't want to have to pay for it properly. It's just another network. And if the things are on the, on the network, then hackers are going to find a way to access and enable those things which are always on the network. Yeah. It's, it's that simple. It makes sense, really. Yeah. Uh, also, what they found is they could get um, personal information from the car, like the contacts, calendar appointments, call mm-hmm. logs, the locations where the car's been, and Wi-Fi passwords. Talking of vehicles and data collection, though, Alan, California are doing something. Yay, data privacy in the USA. Yay. To be fair, in cars, it's everywhere. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. California's new privacy regulator uh, said on Monday, according to this story from the Wall Street Journal, that it's going to embark on its first ever enforcement action. And that's going to be a review of the privacy practices of connected automobiles. Basically, somebody over here is going to start looking at um, just what's being collected in some of these vehicles. Uh, and what they're going to do with it. This follows uh, the start of an investigation back in February uh, by the Dutch privacy regulator when it started investigating uh, Tesla and the way that, particularly uh, the way that the external security cameras uh, or the external cameras operated Mm. and their ability to just start recording people as they walked past uh, without anybody's knowledge. Yeah, don't forget, we also reported on how Tesla employees were sharing. Oh, yeah, this, sharing, said, said, well, sharing said videos. Yes, yes, exactly. As an additional level of ungoodness. Hmm. So there's lots of stuff there. What California starts, many of the other states reluctantly follow with. Yeah. There is a GDPR-esque law in certain states, uh, California, Connecticut, and three or four others where you are allowed to opt out and have the right to be forgotten and all these other good things. Mm. That we, um, in Europe, uh, have come to just take as the norm. Yeah. Um, although that's getting harder in Britain. It's, uh, it's quite disgusting over here. Mm. This uh, article that's linked in the show notes does tie in with, over the weekend, there was a, a piece about, a hysterical piece, really, that conflated Chinese EVs with the danger of security. Uh, you'll, you'll notice, by the way, we're not actually covering that story, despite our normal grumbles about data collection and security. Yes. Because it was just a bit too... Uh, well, I, I don't understand why a Chinese EV is the worry, considering all cars now, brand new mm. cars now, suck up so much data. I mean, that, the person who, who did that will be absolutely petrified then of getting in a modern car, any modern car, whether it's internal combustion or an EV then, because it does, they do it now. They all have that ability and they all do it now (laughs) and to varying degrees of privacy policies. (laughs) This again, it's another special edition I've got to do. Add it to the long list. Um, But yeah, it, it, mm, yeah, there, there are real big issues because there are plenty of companies out there. One just went belly up um, that I talked to at move last year that Oh, they were the ones that in the, they were the ones that initially said they don't weren't collecting anything. Yes, yes, but they're not. They had a very big stand. Must yes. be lots of investor money on in that one. Yeah, and they went belly up. The, there are companies out there that are making grand statements on the data that they collect from our vehicles that they can infer certain things about 
us as individuals about our health and they use our routines and the places we've been to create digital profiles of us. Mm. And whilst at the point of collection may be anonymized, and this is where it all gets, I get really cross about, it is then taken to a data broker who then lumps in with other information that is tied into that vehicle and you, and they go, oh, this is this person's car. Great. We Mm. can see all their routines, et cetera. There is, so rather than, I mean, I'm going to have a quick rumble about the USA, rather than re- le- rather than legislate against stuff, there are now companies that you pay that will then remove your data from the data brokers. And the data brokers do not make it easy. No. Paying this company, and then some of the data brokers will send you three emails trying to confirm different things. It's like, no, I'm trying to get you to not have this information. Yeah. Uh, it's quite pathetic. Sorry. Yep. I'm not, I'm not very flag-wavy this week <laughs> i was last week i'm not this week you see he's not on his trip now yeah i know tell me about it um that brings us i think to guilt minute uh that's the quick break in the show where we ask for a tad of financial support to keep the lights on and the hosting running if you feel the poetry podcast is worth a small consideration every month then you can become a patron different levels of patron include different levels of commitment from us to you including being able to watch the show recorded live we also have a small range of merchandise in our spring store from stickers to mugs and t-shirts. If you don't have any spare cash and we completely understand, then you can help us by following for free from a podcast player to receive every show as they're released and by liking and rating the show in whatever way your podcast supply lets you. If you've done all that, and some of you do, so thank you very, very much indeed, then the last thing you can do is to recommend this to your friends or colleagues. Yes, thank you everyone that does. Yes, much appreciated new new car news and if you don't like an suv i'm sorry it's not an suv no no this is a proper off-roader but you know no but you know what people will say because because anything that's jacked up is an suv doesn't matter how relevant that is because all suvs are equal doesn't matter if it's a puma or an x6 yeah or yeah (laughs) yeah it's it's but enough of that grumbling because otherwise it's going to be the grumbling episode Uh, we're going to talk about the new Toyota Land Cruiser that was revealed last week Mm -hmm. and uh, there are two looks to this should we say the first thing about this Mm -hmm. is that it was a global reveal of the new Land Cruiser the Land Cruiser is a world car it is sold everywhere and it is sold in such amazingly varied specifications depending on where you are in the world yes the land cruiser you buy in just pick a reason the land cruiser you buy in kenya Mm -hmm. will have very few of the same specifications as the land cruiser you buy in the uk but it will essentially be the same car so this is the first new Land Cruiser in 14 years because it's, it's new from the ground up. Mm. They're, they're putting it on the global platform. Mm-hmm. Next thing is it's worth mentioning that this is a Colorado-sized Land Cruiser, not an Amazon-sized Land Cruiser, if you know what I'm talking about. So there are two sizes of Land Cruiser. There is the big one, which is no longer sold in Europe. And there is the smaller one, which is sold in Europe. This is the size of the smaller one. I'm making that point because the US media has confused the living heck out of everything because over here they only got sold the bigger one as a Land Cruiser, but also as a Lexus LX, uh, and the smaller one as a Lexus GX. Everybody's going, oh, this is much smaller than its predecessor. It's like, no, it's kind of the same size as its predecessor. It's just a different model. Well, talking of size, it's 4,920 millimetres long, 1,870 millimetres tall, and has a wheelbase of uh, 2,850 millimetres. So it's just slightly larger than the predecessor. Than the correct predecessor. Yes, the, the, the predecessor that we over here in the UK uh, will understand. Hmm. But, that, but it is uh, apparently much roomier inside as they've redesigned the, uh, the cabin and stuff. It does look very plush in the pictures, which you would expect. They are aiming for the, the road manners and as well as the comfort of everyone inside it to have been, the, the bar has been raised is what they're after with this model. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, externally, it obviously harks back to some of their heritage uh, mm-hmm. with the model. And 
I'd happily take either of the two front faces that it's got. Internally too, by the way, stuff like the round face events at the outer edges and stuff are back to some of the, the Land Cruisers from the, the early 80s, certainly. Yes, there's lots of kind of neat things. It's very much taking, I don't know, they, they had a more modern starting point than Land Rover with the Defender. Yes. But it's very much that. It's a homage, but it's not pastiche. Yes, exactly. Worth mentioning that you're saying it's, it's very plush, and that, that's quite right, but there are a number of different versions starting from cloth seats in the most basic right the way up. And then, of course, there is a similar but different a Lexus version with certainly over here uh, in the US will be so, sold with a three and a half litre twin turbo hybrid, putting out 300, uh, oh, it might be smaller than that. I think it's two and a half twin tur- litre twin turbo hybrid putting out 350 plus brake horsepower. Okay, well, we're going to get the 2.8 litre four-cylinder turbocharged diesel when it comes, which is um, what's already in the Hilux Mm. and was in the outgoing car. There's going to be a new eight-speed automatic gearbox, and uh, later next year, there will be a mild hybrid version for this, so that's going to be their first electrified Land Cruiser. I would imagine they would be doing a lot of testing particularly considering this is expected to work in rugged conditions more often than not to make sure all systems are okay Mm -hmm. with this. uh, You know, it's not, this is not a car that's expected normally to just be parked up on the side of a street in a town. This is expected to do things. Yeah. Or it certainly can do them if you need them to do them. Yeah. Right. Do you want to take us to an even bigger (laughs) SUV? Uh, The even bigger SUV but from completely the opposite end of the idea. Yes. The Pininfarina Pura Vision, a luxury electric land yacht, according to Top Gear. Pininfarina's follow-up to the Batista is this bonkers four-seat luxury EV with rear-hinged doors and much power. (sighs) I don't really know where to start with this. I think this one looks very silly. I just don't. I just don't get it. I, I don't like it. You know how Andrew normally. You know how not, I don't even. Yeah. Well, that's it. I just don't even like it. You, the, you know how Andrew normally is the one that goes. Yeah. Well, supercar doesn't really bother me. It doesn't really interest me. I've got to say, and this kind of ties in with our lunchtime read later on, that I looked at this and thought, yeah, so what? Mm. I, I don't. I mean, great. It's well. It it's it is absolutely massive. It's six meters long, so that's longer than the Land Cruiser. Two meters wide, that's wider than the Land Cruiser. One point seven meters tall, which I think is about the same height. Same height as a Land Cruiser, but it's a sort of big. It's like it's a saloon that they've just jacked up, jacked up thing, and that doesn't seem to tie in at all to me. I mean, the Pininfarina can design some gorgeous looking vehicles. They've had some dogs as well over the years, but this is definitely in the dog region. I, I I think so. I mean, twenty three inch wheels. It's just it's just all this massive scale. It's excess. It, it's it's all about excess. It this will is- look just great in the UAE. There you go. Mm-hmm. That, I mean, that's that's it. That's the only place that this will work. I mean, it's too ridiculous even for California. Uh, the only place that this will work is in the Middle East. Yeah, enjoy it. Good, right, great. The, the good thing about this, do you know what's good about this? Pina Farina will continue as a brand because they will make money from it. Yeah. And that, that is that's the only great. positive. I mean, that's really. the only positive. This will come out in the evenings in the Middle East, and that's that. Yeah. I have no idea how many they'll build, but. Going to move on from that, though, to the news that seemed to get social media knickers in a twist, whether you are pro estate or seemingly anti estate. And this is that Volvo is now ditching all estates in its range and is going SUV only because there's no saloons either. In in the UK. Yes, this is the UK. And also, they will be supplying them to police, though. Yes, it will still be available to police and emergency services. Yes, but uh, you and I, we can only buy SUVs from uh, Volvo moving forward. But But if we're being sensible about this, Andrew... Mm. What would we, we buy to... any? Not really. Uh, what would we buy anyway? We would, if you were going out and you were looking at them, and you go, mm, "Yeah, well, okay." The 
V90 is lovely, but it is very long, and I can get just about the same practicality from uh, an XC60. Mm -hmm. You'd buy the XC60, wouldn't you? And you go, well, it's easy to get in, it's hard headline. The thing is here, right? If people were actually buying them, Volvo wouldn't stop selling them, making them available no. to, to, for sale. So yeah. it, it, that's what it comes down to. I don't care if you like a car with a long roof. If you're not going to buy a car with a long roof, new, the manufacturers are not going to sell cars with a long roof, new. Mm. Yeah. Don't just sit there and whinge. Put your money where your mouth is. If you can, yeah. If you can. But equally, equally though, on that exact point, the people who leapt up and down and got really, really patronising to people who expressed disappointment that hmm. estates were going. Oh, that's just as bad, by the way. You can all get in the sea because I think you, there's a lot of people on Twitter needed to have a look at themselves in the mirror and think, am I actually, um, should I be saying that publicly? Because people are allowed an opinion. Hmm. They are allowed to express something, even if they didn't buy it and even if they couldn't buy it. They're still allowed to go, I'm disappointed there's no Volvo estates. I agree. It is a shame. Mm -hmm. It is a shame. But as a, a business. world with those as well, but I totally understand the business reason. And, yeah. you know, and, and I, I say what I've just said as someone who does try to put his money where his mouth is. Mm -hmm. I want people to keep selling small convertibles. So buy a small convertible. Mm -hmm. I want not a special edition hot hatches. I will buy not a special edition hot hatches. On one hand, uh, on one hand, people should not get judgmental about what other people buy to drive around, within reason. Yeah, because it makes sense. Mm. And this whole anti SUV thing that's going on at the minute, get a life. Frankly, yeah, because if you, if you don't like there them, there are don't buy so them. many practical reasons. Yeah, there's there's a lot of reasons that people like them. Some of them. I'm saying that like them, that buy them, despite more, the fact that they'd rather buy something else. More perception. Some some of the reasoning is more perception rather than reality. Anyway, there will be a link also to a, quite an amusing Top Gear mm. article about Volvo Estates. Yes, from Correspondent. Yes. <laughs> Do click the, through that on the show notes just for a, an extra little chuckle. Brings points of interest uh, next, and our lunchtime read. And this one is from Michael Bonofsky and his, his site, May I Drive Your Car, which isn't actually about driving your car. Um, but he's got an interesting piece uh, about if you're tired of all the record-setting cars, then you're not alone. Then it's an interesting few minutes of, of thought piece. And you can subscribe and get articles and updates uh, to your email inbox uh, as and when. Because you might not always agree with Michael. But he's, he's got an opinion, and it's normally an interesting opinion, and it's normally pretty well put. Yes. So it's pretty much it's, always pretty well put. I, I put it there in the same bracket as looking out. It always makes me think. Mm -hmm. Whether I agree or not is different, but it always makes me think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like so uh, it's, it's worth a, a subscribe, but this one here about, the, uh, about this, all the sort of record-setting stuff, and record-setting in general and how it's everywhere, uh, at the minute is, is well worth a, a five or ten minutes of your time over lunch. Yeah. So I will take us to the list of the week. And after last week's time-bound list of the week, I've brought us another one. This is from Autocar, the best cars of the 90s. And this is very much from, the, from a UK and European uh, side, as opposed to, to the American equivalent that we had. Yes. So, Alan, in the 42 slides... Don't worry, everyone. There's plenty of options. Anything that stands out for you? Uh, I've just managed to break the Autocar slideshow. As always, when I've got to slide nine, uh, I'm going to see it, say the Renault Scenic. Okay. Very much a vehicle of its time. The, the Megane Scenic. Just, you know, when MPVs were MPVs and, and men were real men and all that kind of stuff. They did seem to be everywhere. They did there seem was, to there was strike that a chord. Flurry of everything everywhere. But, and to be honest, most of the time, an MPV is the right answer. I mean, there's, there's 42 years, so I might as well mention that the Fiat Multiple is in there as well. But uh, MPVs were, were everywhere. MPVs are still the correct answer to most people's vehicular needs. It's just that all of a sudden, there was this change in opinion, and everybody wanted their MPVs to look like an off-roader. And, and we've ended up where we are today. Yes. Where we have MPVs pretending to be off-roaders. 
Well, the Peugeot 3008 yeah. was the prime example of that. Yeah. I'm an incredibly disgusting looking MPV into an MPV that was bodied by something rather attractive as an SUV. Yeah, yeah, uh, you, fair enough. I mean, I know that you're in the anti-MPV brigade. Although I basically have an MPV. Yes, you do. Well, that was one of the other choices there, so I was leaving that one for you. But um, yeah, it's, so I think that that really defined that era of, of, of the 90s. There's some lovely cars in here, some very cool cars in here, mm. um, some very desirable cars in here. But I think that the one that really epitomized that point in time was the Renault Megane Scenic. Okay. Well, I'm going to sl- take a slightly different tack, and I am going to narrow down to a specific car and what it did for the company, and that's the Alfa Romeo 156. Oh, it actually made them relevant again. Yes. It made them interesting, and it made people want to own Alphas. I say that. The 156, very nice. I've always liked the looks of the 155, because I'm a weirdo. No, I like that too. Don't worry. I think that's a great choice as well, yeah. Yeah. But there is a, a, a ton of... There's so many that we could have picked in this. So, so many. Um, it, mm-hmm. it really is a really good list to run through. Do click the link as ever in the show notes and don't forget, let us know if you agree with us or not. Mm-hmm. Nicely though, please nicely. <laughs> You're an idiot, Alan. Yeah. I do that to him. You don't have to. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and finally this week comes from Indiana uh, where a Google Maps car got into a police chase at up to 100 miles an hour. It was uh, near Middletown, and where the police department say they, they spotted a car speeding at about 100 miles an hour, and the officer attempted to catch up with the car. The driver kept going faster for several miles, uh, jumped a red light, uh, and eventually, it seems, tried to do a tried to do a Dukes of Hazard and jump and jump a river, uh, and uh, failed miserably, uh, putting the Honda. Uh, it's a U.S. market HRV. I've forgotten what that's now called in the U.K putting the Honda uh, HRV um, into, into the water, uh, complete with all the camera stuff on the roof. Uh, supposedly the driver holding a Florida license, so this is a Florida man story, everyone, <laughs> gave no reason for the chase other than that he was scared to stop. Uh, the driver was taken to a hospital and then jailed by authorities and charged with resisting law enforcement with a vehicle. Was he trying to do the quick route? Was he mapping the yeah, quick route? Yeah, pretty well. <laughs> Uh, Google indicated the Street View car was driven by an external contractor and blah, blah, blah. We're we're committed to working with the contracted company and local authorities to ensure the proper actions are taken to address this situation. Uh, And people say, everybody, of course, is saying they really want to see the footage from those cameras. Yes. (laughs) It's amazing how much neater the Google cameras are than they used to be. Mm -hmm. Because it used to be this massive, big beach ball on top. Yeah. And now it's a much slicker setup, but then the hundreds and hundreds of these cars and mm. have covered millions of miles to, to refine it, I suppose. Yep. Yep. Well, that's a good one. Do click the drive link in the show notes. Mm-hmm. So that's about it for this week, I think. I think so. Mm-hmm. So everyone, don't forget between now and next week, you can give us any feedback, share your thoughts with the show at Motoring Podcast on Twitter and Instagram, on Facebook and on the contact page of motoringpodcast.com hub of all our activities so remember you can support us financially via patreon and please leave a review and rating on apple Podcasts or however your podcast app lets you do such a thing andrew in the meantime what's the best way to get in touch with you best way to get in touch with me is to search on twitter or mastodon for crack windscreen and you should find me there and alan if people would like to get in touch with you personally what's the best way for them to do that uh, pretty much any of the established social media networks uh where i'm at ajp bradley that's b-r-a-d-l-e-y Uh, We'll be back very soon. Until then, I've been Alan Bradley. I've been Andrew Clues. And safe motoring.